Nice to see you here. And uh, the only downside of the Saturday night Bible study is that uh, it really puts a study crunch on me, and I'm not really well prepared this morning, and I apologize for that. Um, but um, I have, uh, well, I'm excited about what we're going to study this morning, so please join me in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to focus again on uh, moral excellence. Moral excellence. While you're turning. I think that there probably isn't a person in the room this morning that didn't think about getting dressed this morning because it's one of those things that's quite a conscious activity. I don't think anybody gets up and just, you know, throws on anything without even thinking about it. I think that every one of us thinks about the clothes we put on, right? Do you think about your clothes when you put them on? I know that if I don't, my wife will. <laughs> And uh, how many of you, I want you to be honest now, how many of you thought about your own appearance since you came in the door this morning? Yeah, put your hand up if you thought about your appearance this morning. You did? Yeah? Did you think about, you know, your, uh, you know, whether your uh, skirt was all the way down or your sweater was sticking up over the top of your pants or whether your socks were... Uh, straight or do you think about stuff like that yeah i always check my zipper about 40 times a day oh it's just one of those things i always do and uh because there have been times when i didn't and i was sorry um actually paul bavoni uh, said hmm, you look like jesus this morning because i'm wearing my sandals on a snowy winter day and uh, that was actually a very conscious thought process this morning because I'm not going to wear my nice Sunday shoes to church on a day like today because I hate having wet feet, you know. So I decided consciously this morning to put my snow winter boots on, my nice warm ones, and carried my sandals to church like all the smart ladies do. They always carry their indoor shoes with them and their outdoor shoes, they wear them, so... Now I'm starting to get smart at 50 years of age. <laughs> and uh, that was a conscious choice. And, you know, I'm very happy to be wearing my sandals today. And it, I, it's just kind of toasty warm there. And it's kind of nice. And I'm conscious of my appearance. And uh, how many of you can go to the bathroom without looking in the mirror? Hands up. <laughs> can you actually go into the bathroom and use the facilities... <laughs> It uh, doesn't matter what you do and come out without looking in the mirror. How many can actually do that? How many do that on a regular basis without looking in the mirror? Hey, you're very, very well-adjusted people. Because the rest of us are rather insecure and uh, or egotistical or something, and we always have to look at ourselves. I, I just, I don't think I ever go to the bathroom without looking in the mirror. That says something about our personality, doesn't it? It says something about our mindset. Now, am I off the wall here this morning or what? No, I'm right on target because we're going to be talking about getting dressed from Colossians chapter 3. And I believe that the very same thinking patterns that relate to our physical dress on a daily basis, in fact, are the very same processes that we should be thinking about in terms of our moral appearance our moral qualities or virtue. Yeah, well, it's, these are the exact terms that Paul uses. For example, just look at a couple of references with me in Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 8. But now you also put off all these things. Look at verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Verse 10. And have Put on the new man that is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We're talking about 
appearances and character qualities and what makes us what we are. Verse 12, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Verse 14, and above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. All the way through this passage, Paul is making contrast between things on earth and things in heaven. Our clothes that we're wearing today relate to things on earth, but our character relates to things in heaven. It really does. It, it is, has to do with our spiritual nature and our moral excellence, the, hopefully the moral excellence, the moral qualities that we have, uh, that God in heaven is attempting to uh, fashion us with so that spiritually speaking we appear this way and we have these um, well it's the dress code spiritual dress code uh, it's the clothing of the soul what well, actually that's a term I got off the dictionary this morning as I was looking through the words uh, somebody referred to the clothing of the soul clothing of the soul have you ever thought about your uh, have you ever thought about that that um, at the moment you die the moment I die we go into the presence of the Lord second Corinthians chapter 5 says to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord but we will not be naked or unclothed God will continually keep every soul and spirit that he has brought into existence by his creative power clothed with some kind of a body. He puts a shell around every soul and spirit. When you die, the New Age concept of, or the Hindu concept, or the Buddhist concept of kind of just, you know, melding into the rest of the creation, like your ashes are scattered over the universe or whatever, and spiritually becoming one with the all, you know, that's completely foreign to biblical concepts. God is a spirit. He is omnipresent. He is everywhere, but he is distinct from his creation. If you believe he becomes his creation, you are a pantheist. God remains the creator, distinct from his creation. He is everywhere, omnipresent, but he's distinct from his creation. So God is wherever there is anything that he has made. But he, the tree is not God. And the leaf is not God, and the rock is not God, and the person is not God. You and I are not God. We're his creatures. And interestingly, every thing in the universe, material and immaterial, is clothed and limited by a shell of some kind. It has a body. A tree has a form, and the tree is not outside the form. It's within the form. You are here, and you are within your form. You are not somewhere else. And departed people who die, this is another lie of the devil, you know, to confuse the whole picture. When people die, they are not with us. They just are not. That's, you know, a sentimental fancy. You know, the spirit of departed people does not continue to be with the loved ones who are left on earth. I am sorry, but that's the way it is. They, when you leave your soul and spirit leave this place, your body stays, it decomposes, and your soul and spirit either go to be present with the Lord where he fashions a spiritual body temporarily for that soul and spirit. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says that when Jesus Christ returns, he will return with those who have gone before. Believers will return. Their soul and spirit do not sleep. Soul sleep is a lie. Your soul and your spirit continue to live in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and your soul and spirit will return with Christ in the rapture and he will miraculously change, reunite you, your soul and spirit with your rejuvenated and changed physical body that is now made immortal and incorruptible, fashioned for glory. Now that's the nature of the case. Now I kind of digress there, but it all relates we have a spiritual body. We are spiritual beings, and presently our physical body houses our spirit and our soul, but that will not always be the case. 
We ought to be concerned about our spiritual appearance before God. Did you know that I believe angelic beings have the ability to see in the spiritual dimension? We do not see at present in the spiritual dimension. We see dimly, we see through a glass darkly, Paul says. God to us is difficult to perceive because he is spiritual and we are limited by time, space, and matter, by our five senses. Someday God will take away those blinders and he will give us eyes, spiritual eyes, without limitation. Then we, he will, we will know him as we are known, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 13. Right? Clear vision then. And I believe that angelic beings see in the spiritual dimension what your moral character is like. They know how badly off you and I are. They can see it. They can see what we're like morally. They see the lack of moral excellence. They see the moral excellence. They see the virtues. They see the vices. It's not hidden. They're spiritual beings. God sees. Now, I don't believe that an angel in this particular vicinity can see the, the, somebody in Sault Ste. Marie. I think angels are, are like you and I. They're, they're limited creatures. They're not omnipresent. The devil can only be one place at a time. It says that he, he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. Well, that's where Jesus' body was, and that's where the devil was at that particular time. In Matthew 4, when the devil was in the wilderness, he wasn't in Africa at the same time. He is not like God. He is not the yin-yang concept of Buddhist uh, and Taoist and Hindu theology is completely false. Yin-yang, you know what that is? It's the circle with that squiggly line through the center. The black and the white are equal in size and dimension, right? And constantly going back and forth. And that's uh, Manichaean philosophy of duality, ancient Eastern religion, that the evil God, eternal evil God, is equal to and constantly opposes the eternal good God or the good forces, evil forces, are balanced out in the universe, and that's a lie of the devil. The devil is constantly exalting himself to be equal with God, and the fact of the matter is, you all know, the devil is a created being. He was created as Lucifer. When he fell, he was judged by God. He is subject to God. He is today subject to God. He cannot go past his chain's limits. And someday God will put him in a, in a confined space. This is going to be painful to him. And so the devil is not equal to God. He is not as powerful to God. God is omnipresent. The devil is not omnipresent. He is limited. And this relates to you and to I. We are not, our soul and spirit are not ethereal, floating throughout the universe at will. If you ever talk to somebody or if you take drugs and you think that you have um, transmigrated out of your body and traveled to another part of the universe, you know what you have done? You did not do that. A, de a demon lied to you and gave you an extra sensory perception of having done so. That's the way it works. Okay? Now, that, some of that is my opinion, okay? But I, that's, you know, putting the theology together with what I know the Bible says about the nature of the human frame and person, I believe we are limited to what God makes us. And we do not have the ability to leave our bodies and travel around the universe and transmigrate, etc., etc. Right? Those are the claims of New Age, and New Age is demonism. So getting back to the point here, you and I are probably overly concerned about our physical appearance and the clothes we wear. I think most men are more realistic than most women. You know, we really don't care. You know, it's, we care a little bit, right? I think the whole fashion industry has, has caused most women to be overly concerned about appearance. Really, right? Very much so. And, uh, you know... Now, maybe that's a sexist remark, and you can delete it from the tape if you get a tape, you know. But I, uh, that's my opinion. I think that the fashion industry is really of the devil, right? I think fashion should be functional. And uh, Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, that let your moderation be known to all men. And men and women together are supposed to be chaste and... Uh, modest in appearance we're supposed to have uh, we're actually you know paul comes right out and says women aren't supposed to wear jewelry 
A lot of people don't like that statement in First Timothy chapter 2, but Paul says it. And uh, you're not supposed to worry all that much about your hair. And, uh, you know, people go overboard. Right? And that's the fact of the matter. And uh, there are certain denominations of Christians that, um, you know, that practice that today. But they make it a law. Right? And it should be a personal choice. Now, so... Uh, we're talking about appearance here of the soul and spirit, clothing of the soul. And it should match. You know, Peter says it. Paul says it. It's, it's actually a biblical theme. We ought to be concerned about our appearance, but we ought to be less concerned about fashion of this world because the fashion of this world are passing away. And you spend $500 on clothes and hairstyles of this year, and guaranteed next year they'll be out. Right? You have to spend another $500 on it. And uh, you might as well. In fact, I think God laughs in heaven. He dumped six inches of snow on it. And you know what? It doesn't matter what you wear because it's going to be covered up by big boots and heavy coats and warm hats, right? And uh, I think he gets a kick out of that. That's my opinion again. So um, what's involved in uh, the clothing of the soul? Uh, let's look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. The first four verses introduces us, us basically to the mental outlook, the, the perspectives that we ought to have, the uh, thought processes that will actually dictate to you how you wear your spiritual clothes. It has to be a conscious thing. Because if you don't consciously go through this thought process, you know what you normally wear? You will get up and you will put on your dirty old fleshly clothes again. Without even thinking about it, wearing your dirty duds is normal. The, the defiled clothing of the soul is the normal thing. That's what everybody on TV wears, right? Dirty clothing of the soul. 99.99% .99 of the people on TV are not concerned about morality and ethics and virtue, right? And so the clothing of their soul and spirit is contaminated, the filth, filthy, the spotted of the world. Right? James says that true religion and undefiled is to keep yourself unspotted by the age. We ought to be concerned about the clothing of our soul. So the, the mentality starts in 3, 1 to 4. Since then, first class condition, this is considered to be a reality, since then you have been raised with Christ, we all have been raised with Christ if we are believers. We are to seek those things which are above. Present tense. This is a present imperative. Continually be seeking after those things which are above. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above. That's a very confusing translation. Verse 2 is talking about another present thing that we do. Continually directing your mind to something it's a synonym for seek to seek and to set your mind or your affections on something are the same thing really just two different ways of saying the same thing to make the point you are constantly striving to set your mind on heavenly things and constantly uh, directing your mind literally on things above not on things on the earth. How do you do that? How do you constantly set your mind on things above? It's what you listen to. It's what you read. It's what you watch. It's what you meditate on. It's what you fantasize. It's what you talk about. So if someone was to take a video clip of five minutes of your life yesterday, pick any five minutes, and then play it back to you, of that five-minute video clip of your behavior, did you mention God's name? Was there anything spiritual in the conversation? Was there any witness? Or is there, was there anything that related to thinking deep philosophical thoughts? Or was it pleasure-oriented, me-centered, fashion-conscious, talking about things that are transitory and that aren't going to last beyond the fire of God's judgment? 
or even worse, uh, things that are immoral, watching things that are immoral, reading things that were immoral, um, listening to things that were godless and filthy. And that's why the media uh, that we watch as Christians is so important because what it does, it, has, it, it sets your mind in tracks or grooves. The soundtracks, they actually have 8 or 10 or 12 or 16 soundtracks on each one of those, you know, uh, DVDs or, or CDs and audio tracks and stuff, you know, like, you know, they can put all kinds of tr stuff on the different tracks of the music that you listen to and in the, in the videos that you watch. And um, they, can do, they do it consciously. The people that produce this stuff put that garbage in there. Because they know that if it's on their track, it's going to be on your track. You see? And so our mind is tracked. It's like, you know, you turn it on, press play, and right, right away you've gone, you, you've gone, whoosh, go ahead, put your hooks in, right? And you've allowed somebody else to put their hooks in your head, and now they're dragging you down the track, right? And you have purposely and consciously set your mind on things below. That's how it works. I'm glad that two of my three vehicles have radios that either don't work or work very poorly. Because most of the time I'm riding in one of those two vehicles. The only one that works is the van, and I hardly ever drive the van. Okay? And, uh, and so I can't listen to the radio when I'm in my car. What does that do? It allows me the freedom and the privilege of keeping my head closed to things below if I choose to, and it's much easier to if somebody you're not listening to somebody that's already, you know, putting their hooks in your brain. See? And so to set your mind is present tense. Set your mind, set, seek those things which are above. Set your mind on things above. Means continually put your mind on tracks that lead to heaven rather than tracks that lead to earth. Now, I know that you have to, when you live in this world, there are times you have to consciously set your brain on earthly tracks. Right? Because if you're doing a job, and, you know, if your mind's in, floating around in heaven, you know you're going to cut your arm off or fall off the, the building or drive into somebody, you know. Dangerous to drive down the road with that thousand-yard stare. Right? If you're going to pray, go ahead and pray, but limit your meditation you know, so that you're still connected <laughs> to the planet, all right? But driving down the road is a great time to set your mind on things above. You know, you can pray. I love driving into town to go to work because it gives me 20, 25, 30 minutes to pray, you know? And uh, if I got a problem, I'll just mull that over and I'll talk to the Lord about it. And, you know, I'll ask the Lord for wisdom and guidance and help. And that's setting your mind on things above. And Paul says the reason we ought to do that is because we have died to this life. Verse 3, you are dead. This is amplified in Galatians and in Romans. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. So he's really saying that we have one foot on earth, one foot in heaven. Or actually to more accurately describe the picture, we are actually citizens of heaven. We live in heaven. That's where we live. Our life is there. It's in the vault. Safe in Christ. So while we're down here, we're kind of like having an out-of-body experience, an out-of-spiritual body experience. And this is not real reality. It's sort of reality. But the real reality that defines our true experience as Christians is that we are heavenly citizens. We are hidden in Christ. That's where our life is. And so our mind should constantly think about home. I worked three days last week for a guy from Kalamazoo, and his mind was constantly on things of home. That's all he talked about. Debbie, I wish my wife was here. And he talked about his workers. And he says, I hate those guys. Well, he, was, he hated everything. It was just a way of manner of speaking. He really likes them. But he was constantly, he was a joker, and he was constantly talking about Bob and the other two guys that work on his crew and Debbie at home and his church and his pastor, very loyal guy to his local church. And his renters and his properties and it, everything he talked about all week was home. 
How often do you think of home? How often do you think of home? You see, it's a battle, isn't it? Because our our five senses are tuned to things of this planet, and it's very difficult for us to lift our you know, lift off in our brains and continually set our minds on things above. And that's what Paul says is a precondition for all these things that it requires. This stuff comes before the clothing that you put on your soul. Before you put your clothes on, there's a thought process. Before you get up in the morning, you're going to put them dirty underwear on, you're going to put dirty pants on, you're going to put the same, you know, clean ones on. You're going to put those uh, damp socks on that you wore last night, or you're going to put warm, dry ones on. You're going to put stuff on that matches, or it doesn't really matter, because you're going to cover it over with a snowsuit. So we put conscious thought into getting physically dressed for our physical body, and there's no less a challenge for us to put conscious thought when we get up in the morning and throughout the day to be concerned about our, the, the clothing of our soul, putting our heads in gear, thinking about where we really live and where our mind ought to be, where our life really is. And when Christ, who is our life, verse 4, shall appear, someday God is going to transposition us off of this planet into his presence. And that's our great hope. You know something? When we finally get there, body, soul, and spirit, not just soul and spirit, but body, soul, and spirit, you know what? You are going to be totally unconcerned about things below. It's not going to matter a whit. All your investments, your bank account, your four-wheeler, your material things, they're still going to... Did you know that you're going to live on planet Earth with Jesus in the New Jerusalem? And there, your house that you now live in, if it survives the tribulation, will still be here. We're going to be residents of Israel in the millennial age. We're going to be with Christ. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And if he comes back to reign for a thousand years, that's where I'm going to be. And, and the Old Testament says he's going to reign in Jerusalem or the new Jerusalem. And that's where we're going to be. And you're going to care about Gouli River. And your home, Sault Ste. Marie. You're not going to care about it. Your properties. The Bank of Montreal just is not going to be of any value to you. So, since we are citizens of heaven, and since that's where our life really is, and that's where, where our life revolves around Jesus, or actually our, Jesus revolves around our lives, we're hidden inside of him, then that should make a difference to the clothing of a soul, where we, how we dress ourselves spiritually every day. So, the first thing he says in verses 5 to, 10, 5 to 9 is, when you wake up in the morning, you're already wearing your dirty clothing. So you have to do what my wife has threatened often to do with my clothes. I'm going to burn those things. If you wear that shirt one more time, I'm going to burn it. I'm going to kill it. Verse 5, put to death. Put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. The word member means uh, part. It doesn't necessarily refer to physical parts of your body. It just refers to the various parts of our earthly existence. There are certain parts of our earthly existence that we are to annihilate, blow it away, get rid of it once and for all. It's an action. It's not something that takes a long time to do. It's not a drawn out process. You just pick it up like you rip off your clothes. How many can take your clothes off in a hurry? You know, we're not going to go any farther with that. <laughs> but I can take my clothes off in a hurry. Bang, 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 bang. It's done. They're on the ground, right? I take my wet coat off when I come home from work. It doesn't take me two minutes to, it doesn't take me 20 seconds to get my wet boots off, those wet socks, get that coat off, that hat, those, get rid of that stuff. Drop it, bang. And these are all aorist tenses referring to point action 
mortify, point action, put it to death, kill it once and for all. Get rid of fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. These things cause God's judgment to come on disobedient, wayward people. Verse 6, you used to live and wear these things when you once lived in them. Verse 7, but now you all you also put off all these things. Now, he says, you have to choose. And it's kind of like an everyday thing. You have to choose every day to go through that act of disrobing yourself spiritually from the garbage clothes that, that cling to your soul. And so he says, get rid of anger and wrath and malice. Put it off. Blasphemy is an error's tense. Filthy communication out of your life, out of your mouth. Verse 9 is a present tense. Lie not. You know, when they put a negative in front of a present tense in the Greek, it means stop doing something you're already doing. Put a stop to something that you're already doing. Put a stop to the lying that you're doing to one another. Seeing that you have point to action, put off the old man with his deeds. So it's kind of a confusing scenario here. In one sense, God stripped you. He stripped your soul and your spirit of your dirty clothing. And remember the book of Revelation talks about blessed are they who have their robes washed in white. Yeah. So when you became a Christian, one of the things that, uh, one of the 35 things that God did to you is that spiritually he stripped you clean. He washed you with the washing of regeneration. He took that dirty clothing of the soul off of you that was stained and spotted and ripped and torn, and he dressed you in robes of righteousness, white and bright and right. And that's your clothing. And so Paul refers back in this passage to the fact that you did put off that happened to you. God actually did put off that stuff off of you. But it has a tendency to jump back on. <laughs> right? I don't know whether it just, I don't know what the, I haven't put enough thought into that parallel. Maybe somebody could do it. You know, maybe we grow new clothes overnight. Like a, like a snake gets its molty new, you know, it molts the old and on comes the new, but it turns ugly after and has to molt off again later. You know, maybe that's the way our fleshly clothing of the soul is, you know, that would be the parallel. We have to make a choice every, every once in a while, take it off. Well, every day, take it off, get rid of it, just throw it down. Is the whole idea is point action, get rid of it. Verse 10, and you have put on the new man. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, right? Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creation. And uh, Ephesians talks about it. And Romans talks about it. Galatians talks about it. Um, that, that God has made us new. And he has uh, taken us out of the kingdom of darkness, put in this kingdom of light, and he puts the new, the clo new clothes on his new citizens. Uh, he uh, disrobes the filthy soul at salvation robes it new with clean clothes when he brings it into the family of God. This is what he's talking about. You have already put it on, verse 10, point to action, the new man, which is, now this is a present tense, continually being renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You have those new clothes, you have that new man, but that new man is continually being uh, generated and renewed. Verse 12, put on therefore. This is a choice. And I wanted you to notice that, um, I think verse 12 is also an aorist. So this is an action. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, tender mercies. So get rid of all those filthy attitudes, filthy habits of the mind and of the soul and the flesh. Those are the parts, the members, the parts of our life. We're supposed to kill it, take it off, throw it down, get rid of it, disrobe. And instead, put it on consciously. Make a choice in the morning to put on your robe of righteousness, to put on tender mercies, kindness, humbleness 
of my meekness, long-suffering, the virtues that fit your nature and fit your clothing, that God, your new man that God is. You've been made a new person. He wants to, you to look like a new person in your soul and your spirit. And uh, verse 14 through 17 are all present tense verbs. Now, this is what I meant. You know, how many of you thought about your appearance since you came in the door? You know, whenever you got up this morning, you put your clothes on. And you didn't really think too long about it. Probably didn't take you more than a half an hour at the very max to get dressed. That's the difference between my wife and I. I get up and I'm dressed in five minutes. And she gets up and she goes through a process, you know. <laughs> Takes her a while. But, you know, she gets it done, right? And when she's done, she's done. And throughout the day, she's aware of her appearance. And throughout the day, I'm aware of my appearance. And if I have to make adjustments, I make adjustments. And if I have to make changes, I make changes, right? You're continually thinking about your clothing throughout the day. It's a very important thing, you know. If you're working in an office and then you go outside and you have to shovel the driveway, you change your appearance. You change your clothes. You put more on. You change the footwear. You put stuff on your hands. Change the hat wear, the headgear, right? And we're very conscious of these things. And you know something? Becoming spiritually aware of our the clothing of our soul is just like that. You get up in the morning. You put off the old. You put on the new consciously. You have to have your mind set on spiritual things, right? Talk to the Lord in the morning. Read his word in the morning. Let him talk to you. Two-way two -way street here. That's how you set. And then... Turn the stupid TV and the radio off and, and, and don't let those people dictate to you or put seed thoughts in your brain that, you're, that are going to keep your mind in earthly tracks. But allow God's word and devotionals and your conversation and whatever else you can do, keep your mind set on spiritual things as much as possible. And when you get up in the morning, clothe your spirit and your soul with garments of righteousness. Get rid of the parts of your life that are filthy. Throw off those old garments first thing in the morning. And then throughout the day, what are the continual thought processes that we must undergird us to keep that appearance and that clothing in position? Well, verse 14. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Put on is, is an uh, italics there, is simply supplied. So, Look at verse 15. Continually, present tense, let the peace of God rule, be, direct you, guide, umpire in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Continually, present tense, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing in one another, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We sang a song this morning, in fact... Um, put on the garments of righteousness. Where is that? It's here somewhere. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Lift up your voice to God. Praise with the spirit with understanding. O magnify the Lord. Exactly what we're talking about. Put on the garment of praise. You praise the Lord. What does that do? It immediately puts your mind in the proper place and, and turns your gaze off of a downward gaze to an upward gaze. That's exactly what Paul says here. Seek and set your mind on things above rather than on things on the earth. Put on the garment of praise. Put on the garments of righteousness. And I, I, re, I wrote new words to that song while I was sitting in the chair here this morning. Put on the garment of holiness for the spirit of righteousness. Lift up your soul to heaven. Pursue it with all your might and with yieldedness. Oh, wear your garments of righteousness. Wear them throughout the day. And how do you do that? By continually letting the peace of God dictate in your hearts. By continually letting the word of God dwell in you richly. If you only talk about material and earthly things, you're not coming close to the standard that God sets for Christian behavior. What ought to come out of your mind in your conversations with people is spiritual stuff. Not 99% of the time, but it's part of it. It's the fabric of your life, right? You're going to rip that thread out 
If you rip that thread out of your life or all of those threads out of your life, then you're just a natural person, carnal. But if the threads of being saved and on your way to heaven and having hope and being righteous and having a desire to please God and living for the future and overcoming temptation and rejoicing in the Lord and being holy and turning away from evil. If those threads are part of the fabric of your everyday life, it'll come out in your conversation with people. Try it at work tomorrow. Bring the Lord into the conversation. You don't have to, you don't have to preach to the guys. Just talk about the Lord. Just talk about your hope. Just talk about the Bible. Mention the fact that you're a Christian. Bring those fabrics in. Continually let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And whatever you do, verse 17... In word or deed, this is your whole lifestyle, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a present tense verb again. Whatever you do, whatever you continually do, continually do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Continual speech, continual action, continual letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, continually uh, letting your emotions dictate whether you know you're doing right or wrong. And I don't mean subjectivity here. Let the peace of God, how many know what it's like to lose the peace of God at an instant? Eh? Have you ever watched something and you were instantly smitten that you saw that, that you allowed yourself to watch that? Have you ever listened to something that you shouldn't have listened to? Did you ever look at something that you shouldn't have looked at? You know? You will, the, the Holy, the God, the Holy Spirit who lives within you will smite you dead. <laughs> sort of. You know, not kill you, but I mean, he will just... He will rip the peace out of your soul. He'll have a check in your spirit. You will just become instantly attuned to the fact that you just walked off the path into the darkness. You just blew it. And you don't have peace. And when as soon as that, you get that feeling right there, what do you do? 1 John 1, 9. Confess it. Say, Lord, I just blew it. You know, undo it. Erase it. If you can, Turn back, turn away, get back on the track, you know, turn off the TV, radio, whatever. If you looked at, a, at something you should, you just turn your eyes and look somewhere else. If you claim, complained about or criticized, go like this. <laughs> That's the best thing you can do. Put your hand over your mouth and then stop and take your hand off only after you prayed about it and say, Lord, now take my, take my tongue and do the right thing with it. And this is how you clothe your soul with righteousness. The clothing of the soul. Isn't it fascinating? It has everything to do with virtue. You wake up in the morning and you make choices. How you're going to wear, what you're going to wear throughout the day. And then throughout the day you continually are aware of what you're wearing. And there are processes that you continually practice as a Christian that will help you keep your clothes clean. I like it. Very visual. And it's an image that I can carry with me and I hope you will too. Maybe to close this morning, we'll stand and let's sing this song again. I don't know if we can do this. Uh, I don't have the words to it. Can we, we sing my words to the song? Sure. Yep. Right. Maybe what I'll do is I'll try to give you the words before we sing the line. Can we, can we try that? Yeah. Put on the garment of holiness. Put on the garment of holiness. For the spirit of righteousness. Lift up your soul to heaven. Lift up your soul to heaven. Pursue with all your might. Pursue with all your might. And with yieldedness. And with yieldedness. And wear your garments of white. Wear your garments of white. One more time. Put on the garment of holiness. Put on the garment of holiness. For the spirit of righteousness. For the spirit of righteousness. Lift up your soul. Pursue with all your might and with yieldedness. And with yieldedness. Wear, your garments of light. wear your garments of light. That we would wear the garments of holiness and righteousness. That as a